Robert Vinoy, Foundation of Prophecy, Lecture 4, given at Biblical Theological Seminary. We were just talking here about the relationship between prophecy, that is, the message of the prophets, and the term navi, meaning prophet. What I'm saying is the two are very closely connected. The words of the prophet, the prophecy, are really words of God, and may or may not be predictive. In other words, the prophecy is a word from God which fits well with the title Navi. As some of those citations pointed out, with the Greek prophetes, it's really speaking for God. It's not so much the essence of the human words, not so much foretelling, as it is forthtelling. That forthtelling may include a few predictions, but predictions is not the essence of what prophecy is. Let's go on to another term, and that is roe. It's really a participle form of ra'a to see. It's been translated, quote, seer, end quote. Now, as soon as you come to that term and look at the literature on it, you'll find that there are those who attempt to argue that Navi and Roe were originally two different types of people. In other words, you could distinguish between the Roe and the Navi, and that it was only in later time that the two words became more synonymous. One scholar, his name is not important, but I'll give it to you, Alfred Haldar, argued that you find the same difference in some Mesopotamian languages designating, quote, prophets, end quote, as you find in the Old Testament. In Mesopotamia, you have some people who are called Mahu and Baru. What Haldar argued was that the Mahu was the same as the Hebrew Navi, and the Baru was the same as the Hebrew Roe. So it has these two designations in Akkadian Mesopotamian text, and he said the equivalent in Israel is between the Mahu and the Navi and the Baru and the Roe. Now in Mesopotamia, the Mahu and Baru were similar in that both of them had the task of discerning what the will of God was and then making it that known to other people. But there was an important difference between the Mahu and the Baru. The Mahu received the message from the gods directly, and he did so in an ecstatic condition. So the Mahu was an ecstatic, and while he's in an ecstatic condition, he gets a message from a deity, which he then transfers on to others. He does that while he is still in an ecstatic frame of mind. The Baru, however, was different. The Baru received the message indirectly through external means. In other words, the Baru was someone who would read astrological signs or read omens of various sorts. One of the ways in which the Baru determined the will of the Lord was to examine the livers of sacrificed animals and to look at the configurations of the liver. Different configurations of livers have different significances and he would, in that way, determine the will of God. Or he would pour oil out on water, and see what kind of pattern developed, and read something from that. Or cast lots, various external means of determining the will of God. Now what Haldar tries to do then is to say that just as Mesopotamia had their ecstatics and their Baru priests, the same distinction in Israel can be found between the Navi and the Roe. The Navi was the ecstatic who received this message directly from the deity. The Roe was someone who received information externally and then passed it on to others. Now that's an interesting theory. The problem is, if you look at the biblical data, it becomes quite clear the biblical data doesn't fit the pattern. Here you have a pattern from elsewhere that is imposed on Scripture, and the specifics of the scriptural data are forced into an already preconceived pattern. For example, 
Samuel is called, quote, a seer, end quote, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, 11. But he did not work with external means in order to determine the will of God. Now, let me just say something further about this business of determining the will of God by external means before we go further. That is not completely excluded from the Bible. Remember the high priest had the Urim and the Tumim in his robe, and he could determine the will of God through the use of the Urim and the Tumim. When you get in the time of David, and after Saul had wiped out the priests of, at Nob, Aviathar escaped, and he brought the ephod to David. And in a number of chapters you see David saying, quote, Bring me the ephod, end quote. And then he asks questions of the Lord, quote, Shall I go to this place or not? End quote. And the Lord said, quote, Yes, go. End quote. Quote, will I be victorious? End quote. And the Lord said, quote, Yes, you will. End quote. Or, quote, No, you won't. End quote. There was the use of external means in a legitimate way through the biblical material. However, the individual who can use the external means is never called a roe. Abiathar, who had custody, you might say, of the Urim and Tumim, he was a priest. He wasn't a roe. So it doesn't fit the category. You do have reference to individuals who used external phenomena to determine the will of God. But the interesting thing is they are never called, quote, seers, end quote. They are never designated by the term roe. They are called diviners, magicians, soothsayers, or sorcerers. If you look at Deuteronomy 18.10, in that passage, which describes what the prophet is to be and how God is going to speak through the prophet, you read there, quote, Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcrafts, or cast spells, who is a medium, a spiritist, who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. End quote. The Lord is condemning the very thing that these Baru priests did in Mesopotamia, looking at omens from livers or astrological phenomena or whatever. That was something that was forbidden to the Israelites. Now, there's a verse that I think is instructive, although it's a verse that raises a lot of questions, but 1 Samuel 9, verse 9, is instructive regarding the question of the relationship between the usage of Roe and Navi in the Old Testament. It reads, quote, Formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he would say, Come, let us go to the seer, or Roe, end quote because the prophet of today used to be called the seer, end quote. Quote, the Navi prophet of today used to be called the Roe, a seer, end quote. Now that verse, if you're looking at the NIV, you see it's in parenthesis. It's a parenthetical statement that is inserted after verse 8. If you look at the larger context, I think you would conclude that it really fits better after verse 11 than it does after verse 8. You see, this is where Saul's out hunting for his father's lost cattle, and he can't find them. The servant said, There's a seer. Why don't we go ask him? End quote. The servant says, quote, There's a seer. Why don't we go ask him? End quote. He says that in verse 8. The servant said, quote, Look, I have a quarter shekel of silver. I'll give it to the man of God, so that he may tell us what way to take. End quote. Leave verse 9 out for the moment. Quote, Good, Saul said to his servant. End quote. But they still couldn't find the donkeys, so they set out for the town where the man of God was. As they were going up the hill to the town, they met some girls coming out to draw water. They asked them, Quote, is the seer here? End quote. Then you get the use of the word roe. Quote, is the seer here? End quote. And you see verse 9. Then, if you put it down there after verse 11, quote, formerly in Israel, if a man went to inquire of God, he'd say, quote, come, let us go to the seer. End quote. 
because the prophet of that day used to be called the seer, end quote. Now, what many people think is verse 9 was not part of the original text, that it was an explanatory gloss probably in the margin of the text. At some point in the process of transmission, it got put into the text, but they put it in the wrong place. It should have been put in after verse 11 to explain what a seer is rather than after verse 8 where it really doesn't fit so well. I think it's reasonable to conclude that it probably is an explanatory gloss, not part of the original text. But the important thing that it is telling us is there's not essential difference between a prophet and a seer. It's a matter of linguistic usage. Quote, the prophet of today used to be called the seer, end quote. The word, quote, seer, end quote, is older than, quote, prophet, end quote. And in later times, the word navi, or prophet, was the more common term. And the word seer became rather archaic language. You needed an explanation so there'd be no confusion. I think that's probably what's going on here. But if you think about it and put it into its larger biblical context, it raises some other questions. When do we date this remark? That question becomes rather significant because a long time after Samuel, prophets were still called seers. You'll find it in Isaiah, for example, the use of the word, quote, seer, end quote. Also perplexing is that the term navi is used long before the time of Samuel. Abraham was called a navi back in Genesis 20, verse 7. And navi is used in Numbers, it's used in Deuteronomy, it's used in Judges. In fact, Samuel himself is called a Navi in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 20. So then the question becomes, if the word, quote, prophet, end quote, is used before the time of Samuel, how can it be said that what was later termed a prophet was in the time of Samuel called a seer? Now, some people might say, quote, Here's a clear evidence that all the texts of the Old Testament in which the word, quote, prophet, end quote, is used are to be dated long after the time of Samuel, end quote. Is that a legitimate conclusion? Let's go to the Hebrew text. The Hebrew is, quote, for the prophet of today was formerly the seer, end quote. Now, a translation of that is a bit difficult. Notice what the NIV does. The phrase, quote, because the prophet of today takes it as a kind of construct. The prophet of today. Quote, he used to be called a seer, end quote. King James and NASB repeat the verb. Quote, for he that is now called the prophet, or the prophet of today, was formerly a seer, end quote. He that is now called a prophet, roe is called a seer. You only have one verb in the Hebrew Scripture. The NASB says, quote, He is called now Navi, end quote. Now, if you go to the Septuagint translation of 1 Samuel chapter 9, 11, there you get a different idea introduced because there you have, quote, For the people before time called the prophet the seer, end quote. See, how do you tell? Where does that Greek Halaas, the people, come from. Quote, the people, end quote, before time called the prophet the seer. So back to the Hebrew, hayom, what the Septuagint translation presupposes from the Hebrew, instead of hayom, that is today, you would have had ha'am, the people. Do you see how easily that could be confused? In the, quote, yom, end quote, just make the substitution of an ayin for a vav. I think that the Septuagint probably puts the correct light on what's going on here. The difference between the reading of the Septuagint and the Masoretic text is that the Septuagint indicates that roe was more a popular designation of the people, whereas the navi was a more technical or official word for the prophet. The people formerly called the prophet the seer. If that's the case, the word, quote, roe, end quote, 
could continue in use in later times, and the term, quote, prophet, end quote, could have been used early, as we actually find it is. And there's no essential difference between the two. It's a distinction between a more technical and a more popular usage of it, not an absolute semantic differentiation. So the prophets were seers. They were made to see by God what they should proclaim to others. So even the words, quote, Navi, end quote, and, quote, Roe, end quote, are both used. I think we could say they speak of the same function. The people called the prophet a seer formerly. Now, if you're going to make a distinction between them, I think that to this degree it is legitimate to say that Navi shows us a person who is, you might say, turned towards the people to speak God's message, so that the emphasis is on what he has received from God. The Roe shows a person turned to God. In other words, in Navi, the emphasis is more on the proclamation. In Roe, the emphasis is more on receiving the message, seeing the message. So you could say that Navi puts more stress on the active function of proclamation, while the Roe puts more stress on the passive function of receiving the message. But there's no essential difference between the prophet and the seer. Student question, quote, How would seers, the ones that are being asked by a king to come and read the writing on the wall, or whatever, interpret dreams and stuff like that? And how do they not get confused? End quote. Well, I think what you're getting at there is this question of how do you distinguish between the two of them called, quote, prophet, end quote, or not. Is, is that it? I guess if you know people, if the people are calling, you know Isaiah or Obadiah or something, and they're just using the word, quote, seer, end quote, then how would they distinguish the actual prophets, then, from somebody else that they call a seer? Yes, in fact, if you look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, where Isaiah says, quote, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, end quote. There you have the verbal form, ra'ah. So Isaiah had a visionary experience of God. He saw the Lord. He could legitimately be called a navi. I think the emphasis on that term, ra'ah slash roe, is the, on this visionary means of receiving the message whereas the emphasis of the term Navi is more on the proclamation of the message to others. But a Roe and a Navi are the same thing. It's just a different designation. There seems to be a preference among the people for using the term Roe earlier and Navi later. It's a more popular versus technical label for those performing this function. There's no reason biblically to see any distinction. Let's look at Amos chapter 1, verse 1. I was looking for roe, but it's a verb instead of a noun. Quote, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, end quote. If these are the words of Amos, you would expect, in the way we talk of the following phrase, to read, quote, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, what he heard concerning Israel two years before the flood, end quote. It doesn't say that. It says, quote, what he saw, end quote. The focus is on that visionary kind of reception. The verb here is haza. It's this next word we're looking at, which is, quote, he saw, end quote. It's the same thing. It means, quote, to see, end quote, or Quote, to gaze at, unquote. I think the important thing here is this kind of attempt to separate the Navi from the Roe as being two different kinds of individuals is not given in the biblical text. They're the same. Student question. So someone that just worked for the king wasn't considered a prophet, but was a fortune teller or just or one who predicted the future, were they also called seers? No, 
they'd be called soothsayers, diviners, or givers of omens. There were other words for those kind of individuals. Let's go on to the Jose. I don't say much about Haza. It comes from the verb Haza, just like Roe comes from the verb Ra'a. And Haza means, quote, to gaze at, end quote, or to look at, end quote. It's really a synonym for Roe. It's used in the same way. Just as with Roe, the emphasis seems to be on receiving the revelation of God. So if you look at Isaiah 1.1, 1, 1, quote, The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah son of Amotz saw during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah kings of Judah, end quote. The vision is Hazon. It's a noun derived from the verb Hazah. The vision that Isaiah saw, that's Hazon. So you could call Isaiah a Jose, as well as a Navi or Roe. I mean, all these terms are used interchangeably. Let's go on to three. Quote, the origin of prophetism in Israel, end quote. You notice the three subpoints. A is, quote, alleged analogies to Israel's prophetism in other nations, end quote. B is, quote, internal Israelite explanations for the origins of prophetism, end quote. And C is, quote, what I think is a biblical explanation of prophetism, end quote. So first, we want to spend more time on A than on B and C. A is, quote, alleged analogies to Israel's prophetism in other nations, end quote. You'll find in the literature that it's been said that analogies can be found in prophetism in Israel among other peoples and nations in the ancient Near East. Then what usually happens is scholars attempt to explain the phenomenon of prophetism in Israel as being a derivative of these phenomena outside Israel, so that the origin of Israel's prophets is attributed to or explained by analogous phenomena that are found outside of Israel. Now, a few comments on this. I think that from the outset, we have to be honest, clear, and open, and say that we cannot deny that we have come across what I would call, quote, formal similarities, end quote, between what we find in Israel and the phenomena of prophetism elsewhere. In fact, when you think about it, there are a lot of customs, religious institutions, and practices in Israel that have formal analogies among other peoples. But I'm not sure saying that says a whole lot. Even if there are formal similarities, the question is, does that give a basis for saying there's some kind of intrinsic connection or link between what we find in Israel and the surrounding nations? It seems to me, in view of what we have already said about the nature of the prophetic function in Israel, that if these are people chosen by God through whom he will give his word to his people by putting his word in their mouths to speak of any kind of intrinsic link between what goes on in Israel and what we find among other peoples would have to be something that would be highly questionable. It would seem to me that to speak of derivation is something that would be excluded on the basis of prophetic scripture. But having said that, it's also very clear that God speaks to human beings, including to his people Israel, in the Old Testament period, in the context of the culture, the institutions, the thought forms of the people to whom he is speaking. When you look at the Old Testament, you find many phenomena in the Old Testament for which you can find formal analogies outside of Israel. The Old Testament is full of regulations for bringing sacrifice. Other ancient peoples used sacrifices in their religious observance. The Old Testament's sign of the covenant was circumcision. Other ancient people practiced circumcision. Circumcision acquired a very specific significance or meaning in the context of the Old Testament, but it was not something unknown in the ancient world. Think of the whole concept of covenant that seems to have been 
quite clearly molded upon the concept of treaty that governed international relations, those Hittite treaty forms. The biblical covenant form is molded around the Hittite treaty form. God takes an instrument of human legal relationships and utilizes it to structure the relationship which he establishes between himself and his people. That's the great thing. Just take the idea of kingship. Israel, at a certain point, wasn't satisfied with God as their king. They wanted a human king like the nations around about. The Lord told Samuel, quote, Give them a king. End quote. So Israel had a king like the nations around about. However, with the qualification that when God told Samuel to give them a king, Samuel described the manner of the kingship. In 1 Samuel chapter 10, 25, the role and function of the king of Israel was quite different from that of the nations around it. So you had a similarity and a difference. Israel had a king, but it wasn't a king who functioned in the same way that kings outside of Israel did. Israel had a priest. Other ancient peoples had priests. So why should Israel not have a prophet if other ancient peoples had prophets? But what are the essential differences between them? The way in which the prophet functions in Israel and the way in which the prophet functioned outside of Israel was different. So if you can find outside of Israel a formal, I'm saying formal, analogy with what you find in Israel with respect to the prophetic function, I don't think that detracts in any way from the uniqueness of Israel's prophets. Yes, other people had prophets, but in Israel there's something different. The most essential characteristic of prophetism in Israel is that in Israel, the prophet doesn't speak his own ideas. He doesn't give his own words. He gives a message given to him directly by the one and only true God. So when you ask the question about analogies to prophetism outside of Israel with what you find in Israel, I think you have to keep that in mind. But even having said that, I think that the next question becomes, quote, what kind of evidence is there for even some kind of formal analogy to prophetism outside of Israel if it's not, in essence, this intrinsic quality where God is placing his words in the mouth of these individuals, end quote. What kind of formal evidence do we find in the ancient world for this phenomenon of prophetism? Notice on your outline, I have Mesopotamian analogies, Egyptian analogies, Canaanite analogies, and a conclusion. First is the Mesopotamian analogies. The most important extra-biblical text for Mesopotamian analogies are texts that are found at a place called Mari, which is in the vicinity of Babylon in Upper Mesopotamia. It was a prosperous city before the time of Hammurabi. Hammurabi lived around 1700 BC, so that's fairly early. The ruler there in time, just before it fell to Hammurabi, was a ruler known as Zimri Lim. There have been about 5,000 cuneiform tablets found in an archive in the excavation of Mari. Among them, some find traces of what they call prophetism in Mesopotamia. If you look at letter A, on that handout, the first text there under Akkadian letters, you'll notice the heading, quote, Divine Revelation, end quote. This material is taken out of Pritchard's ancient Near Eastern text, usually abbreviated A-N-E-T. It is the standard English language translation of extra-biblical text from the ancient Near East, edited by James Pritchard, published by Princeton University. The first text there is a letter to Itorastu, to Zimri Lim, who was king of Mari. Let me read the text and make some comments on it. It reads, quote, Speak to my Lord, thus Itorastu, your servant, the day I dispatched this tablet of mine to my Lord. Malak Dagon, a man of Shotka, came and spoke to me as follows, quote, in a dream of mine, I was set on going in the company of another man to the fortress at Sigarikon, in the upper district of Mari. 
On my way I entered Turka, and right after entering I entered the temple of Dagon and prostrated myself. As I was prostrate, Dagon opened his mouth and spoke to me as follows, quote, Did the kings of the Ammonites and their forces make peace with the forces of Zimri Lim? End quote. I said, quote, They did not make peace. End quote. Just before I went out, he spoke to me as follows, quote, Why are the messengers of Zimri Lim not in constant attendance upon me, and why does he not lay his full report before me? Had this been done, I would long ago have delivered the kings of the Ammonites into the power of Zimri Lim. Now go, I send you. Thus shall you speak to Zimri Lim, saying, quote, Send me your messengers. Lay your full report before me, and then I will have the kings of the Ammonites cooked on a fisherman's stick, and I will lay them before you. End quote. That's the end of the quote. Quote, this is what this man saw in his dream, and then recounted to me. I now hereby write to my lord. My lord should deal with this. Furthermore, if my lord so desires, my lord shall lay his full report before Dagon, and the messengers of my lord shall be constantly on the way to Dagon. The man who told me this dream was to offer a sacrifice to Dagon, and so I did not send him on. Moreover, since this man was trustworthy, I did not take any of his hair or the fringe across his garment. End quote. So Etorastu says that on the day he wrote this letter, there was this man from Shatga, a man called Malak Dagon, who came to his who came to him with the message. Malak Dagon says he had dreamed in a dream instead of going in the company of another man. In the dream, he and this other person went to Turka, that's a place near Mari, and to a temple of a deity by the name of Dagon, probably the same as the Dagon mentioned in the Old Testament as the god of the Philistines. But the letter goes on to say that Malak Dagon went into the temple. In his dream, the god asked him a question, quote, Did the kings of the Ammonites make peace with the forces of Zimri Lim? End quote. There were probably skirmishes between the soldiers of Zimri Lim and these people called the Ammonites. When Malak Dagon gives a negative answer, the god says, quote, Why aren't the messengers of Zimri Lim in constant attendance upon me? Why don't they give me a full report? Had they done that, I would have delivered these people, the Ammonites, into the power of Zimri Lim. End quote. And then he says, quote, Now go. I send you, thus shall you speak to Zimri Lim, saying, quote, Send me your messengers, lay your full report before me, and I'll have these Ammonites cooked on a fisherman's pole. End quote. So after Itorastu tells Zimri Lim what this Malak Dagon had seen in his dream, he advises him to follow the instruction of Dagon. Now some see in Malak Dagon an analogy with the prophets of Israel. And they set it up this way. Malak Dagon delivers a message from the deity that Zimri Lin was supposed to obey, and the prophets of Israel often gave the message from the deity Yahweh to the king that he was to obey. However, at this point, we'll come back to this later, but at this point, I think it's worthy to notice that Malak Dagon does not do that directly. Malak Dagon gives the message to Itorastu and Itorastu passes it on to the king by means of a letter, a tablet, writes it down, sends it to him. So there's some similarities as well as differences. Let's go on to text B, which is the letter of Kidri Dagon to Zimri Lim. It's a brief text. It reads, quote, Moreover, the day I sent this tablet of mine to my lord, an ecstatic of Dagon came and addressed me as follows. End quote. This is the word mahu for ecstatic. That's the ecstatic of Dagon. The translation, quote, ecstatic, end quote, is based on etymology and general use. But the Mari material gives no evidence of extraordinary psychic condition. Quote, 
this ecstatic of Dagon came and addressed me as follows, quote, that God sent me to hurry right to the king that there to offer mortuary sacrifices for the shade of Yadulim, end quote. This is what the ecstatic said to me. I have, therefore, written to my Lord that my Lord do what pleases him, end quote. Now Kidri Dagon sent this letter to Zimri Lim. He was the governor of a place near Mari. And he says this ecstatic came to him with this message, quote, quote, Write to the king that they are to offer mortuary sacrifices for the shade of Yadu Lim. End quote. Yadu Lim was the father of Zimri Lim, so the father of the king. It says that Zimri Lim had failed to bring offerings to the spirit of his dead father. So Kidri Dagon gets this message from an ecstatic and passes the message on to the king. You notice in the last line he advises the king, quote, you should do this, end quote. But then he qualifies, quote, let my lord do what pleases him, end quote. C on your outline is G on your handout. I won't read all of that, but it's a broken tablet. There's a gap in the middle, and it seems to concern the message of an ecstatic saying that Zimri Lin had to bring an offering to the deity on the 13th day of the coming month, maybe the same offering referred to in the previous text. You notice how it ends. Quote, May my Lord do in accordance as his deliberation pleases. End quote. D on your outline is F on your handout. Another letter of Kidri Dagon with a reference to an ecstatic. So this ecstatic came here earlier, but it is difficult to understand. It seems that the message concerns the building of a city gate. Exactly what is said about the gate is not so clear. Some say instructions are given for a gate to be built. Others say it is a warning not to build it. But it's an ecstatic who reveals a message that is to be given to the king with respect to the city gate. D on your outline is F on your handout. Another letter of Kidri Dagon with a reference to an ecstatic. So this ecstatic came here earlier, but it is difficult to understand. It seems that the message concerns the building of a city gate. Exactly what is said about the gate is not so clear. Some say instructions are given for a gate to be built. Others say it is a warning not to build it. But it's an ecstatic who reveals a message that is to be given to the king with respect to the city gate. E. Quote, conclusion concerning the Mesopotamian analogies. End quote. Right here, there's a list of books and articles. In that literature, many have argued that there are similarities both in form and content between the ecstatics of these texts and the prophets of the Old Testament. Let's look at some of these. As far as similarities in form, it's argued that just as a prophet in Israel received his message from the Lord, Yahweh, so in Mari, an ecstatic received his message from Dagon. That's fair enough. It's a formal similarity. Secondly, as the prophet in Israel brought his message unasked with divine authority to the king, so also in Mari, with this ecstatic, the message was sent on to the king unasked. The king didn't ask for the message. There is no determining in advance whether the king would want to hear the message or not. He was given the message, so another parallel. Thirdly, just as the prophet in Israel is often critical of the actions of the king, so here in Mari with the ecstatic there is criticism. Quote, Why don't you keep me informed? Why didn't you offer a sacrifice? You should have, end quote. So those are what you might call formal similarities, similarities in form. What about similarities in content? Some have argued that in that first text you find something comparable to a prophecy of deliverance in the Old Testament. In other words, quote, if you had kept me informed, had this been done, 
I would have gone and delivered the kings and the Ammonites into the power of Zimri Lim. End quote. So a parallel to a prophecy of deliverance in the Old Testament. A second similarity is found also from the first text about eight lines down. Quote, now go, I send you, thus shall you speak to Zimri Lim. End quote. Similar to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. Quote, you must go to everyone I send you to. Say whatever I command you. End quote. Quote, now go, speak. End quote. So I think at that level, you can say, quote, Yes, there are some similarities between the Mari material and the Old Testament in form and even some faint similarities in content, end quote. But having said that, I think it's very important to notice this isn't done. There are also some very important differences. Let me mention a few of them. First, in the first text, Malak Dagon who received that message, does not go directly to the king. He goes to one of the king's officials. He goes to Itorastu. It is Itorastu who puts the message on a tablet and sends it to the king. So there's an intermediary, you might say, between the prophet who receives the message and the person who delivers it to the king. There's a third party there. In the other three letters, the ecstatic goes to Kidridagon, who passes the message on to the king in written form. So, in other words, in all these texts, the message gets to the king indirectly through a third party. It's customary for the Old Testament prophets to deliver their message directly to the king. A classic example of this is Elijah, who confronts Ahab. He just goes out and confronts him. Or Isaiah, who goes out and confronts Ahaz directly. Secondly, two of the tablets end with a rather striking statement. It's E and G in the handout. E ends with the statement, quote, E ends with the statement, quote, Let my Lord do what pleases him, end quote, after the message has been given. And G, quote, May my Lord be well in accordance with his deliberation that pleases him, end quote. So two of those tablets ended with that kind of a statement. That type of a qualification detracts from the force and authority of the message. Here's the message, but do whatever you want. That certainly distinguishes it from the message of the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets never gave a message from the Lord with that kind of qualification attached to it. Thirdly, the focus of the message in the Mari text does not concern ethical or spiritual realities, but only external cultic obligations. Quote, offer this sacrifice, end quote. Quote, give me a report about what's going on, end quote. The message of the Mari text does not concern ethical or spiritual realities, only external cultic obligations. That contrasts greatly with the message of the Old Testament prophets, whose primary concern was with the moral and spiritual condition of the king and the people. I want to elaborate a bit on that, but I'm already over time, so I'm going to have to stop. But let's pick up with that at the beginning of our next session and go forward from there. The End of Robert Vinoy's Foundation of Prophecy Lecture Number 4 given at Biblical Theological Seminary. Music